So uh, what I'm talking about today um, has very little to do with gender and almost certainly everything to do with, uh, with sex. Um, so the issue of uh, who's more sensitive to pain uh, is actually one of those uh, rare scientific issues where uh, people on the street actually have an opinion. If you ask people, they'll give you an answer. Um, and uh, the answer is often that people believe uh, that uh, women are more uh, tolerant of pain than men. Um, and they usually believe it for reasons uh, described in, uh, in this old joke. Um, what we do know is uh, um, a number of things uh, from uh, epidemiological studies. And uh, really, interest uh, started, I think, uh, with this very famous table in a review paper by Karen Berkeley in 97, um, where she gathered together all the known um, uh, you know, major uh, classes of painful disorders, and she put them into three categories. Uh, ones uh, where uh, the prevalence was higher in females, uh, ones where the prevalence was higher in males, and ones where there was no obvious uh, uh, sex differences in prevalence. And not only is the list of disorders that uh, are more prevalent in female bigger than the male list, um, but also the disorders on that list are more prevalent. Um, and as such, it's been estimated that 70% uh, of chronic pain patients are women. Now, that might be because they're more sensitive to pain, but of course there are many other explanations, right? They may simply be more likely to go to the doctor, or really more accurately that men are less likely to go to the doctor, and so women, of course, are more likely to become patients. So if you really want to know if pain is more common, um, then you can't really look at patient lists. You have to go in and do uh, broad uh, telephone uh, or questionnaire surveys. And of course, this has been done many times as well, and I've summarized the, uh, the evidence here. So so what I've done here is plotted the difference in the prevalence uh, of whatever uh, painful disorder in men and women. Um, so if it's uh, over the line, that means it's more prevalent in women, regardless of what the actual prevalence is. And you can see in every single case but one, um, uh, chronic pain is in fact endorsed by more women than men uh, if you contact them by telephone, um, really across the board, regardless of what kind of pain it is, uh, to the tune of about about five to 10%. Um, but of course, that may not even mean uh, that uh, women are more sensitive to pain than men. To really get at the bottom of that, you have to take them into the laboratory with controlled stimuli um, and uh, do uh, you know, the uh, appropriate uh, um, uh, control laboratory experiments. And of course, this has been done hundreds of times uh, over the years. Um, and amazingly to me, uh, even though there are hundreds and hundreds of studies that bear upon this issue, still we haven't been able as a field to put to bed the question, even though the data, as you can see here, are absolutely overwhelming. And the problem seems to be is that in some of the studies, uh, the sex differences when found are significant. And in other of the studies, the sex differences when found are not statistically significant. But I think, as you can see, they always go in the same direction. So I'm pretty confident in stating um, that women, in fact, are more sensitive to pain uh, than men are. It's not a big difference, but it's a very, very reliable one. But the other thing I'd like to tell you is that I don't think that matters very much. There are bigger fish to fry. There are more interesting sex differences going on here um, that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. The problem, of course, is that even that we know that there are major sex differences in this domain, it still remains the case. This is from a review published in 2005, uh, looking at papers that were published in the 10-year period before that. But nothing has changed. I've actually gone in and looked. It is still the case, overwhelmingly in this field, uh, that the subjects of experiments uh, are male mice and male rats. Um, uh, you know, about 80% of the time and uh, only a fraction of the time are both sexes tested together. Now, I think personally that this is a scandal uh, of, of the highest order. Um, and one can ask why this situation persists. Um, and I think there's a few reasons. Um, one is encapsulated in this quote. This is actually said to me by my, uh, the, the postdoc who was training me uh, essentially in grad school. Um, and I found a sex difference. I found an interaction between sex and something and showed it to him. Um, and he proclaimed, and he was only half joking um, that sex differences are to be enjoyed, not to be studied. By the way, he felt the same uh, way about alcohol research. Um, 
It's true that back in 1992, this wasn't considered a topic that a serious scientist would waste his or her time on. Um, I think the real reason why people continue, even today, to use only male rodents is that there's an expectation based on the fact that rats and mice, like humans, have uh, uh, fluctuating hormone levels uh, uh, through uh, um, you know, over a few day period or over a month in the case of humans, um, that this would somehow render data obtained from female animals more variable than the data obtained from male animals, and thus you would have to use higher sample sizes, and thus it would cost more money, and thus you would get less science done. I think this is the belief that leads to the current inertia. The problem is, is that this belief is empirically false. So on the left are data in pain, showing just an example from one pain test, of how regardless of where the mean is, the coefficient of variation uh, in female mice is not larger than it is in males. In fact, if anything, it's a little bit larger in males than it is in females. Um, this is also now have been shown to be true by a very good paper by uh, uh, Irv Zucker's group uh, published in uh, 2014 um, that across biomedicine, the coefficient of variation in data obtained from male mice is in fact a little bit bigger than in female mice. Or in other words, what everyone is afraid of isn't true. In fact, the opposite is true. One might imagine uh, wonder why that might be, and uh, my best guess is, is that, yeah, female rodents have a source of variation that male rodents don't have, but male rodents have a source of variation that female rodents don't have, which is that they fight in their cages and have dominance hierarchies um, that the females don't have, and this would, uh, one might imagine, would lead to even more variability than the estrous cycle itself. One might ask themselves, uh, okay, fine, there are sex differences and we're using males, but maybe and probably males are a good enough proxy for females uh, that it doesn't really matter which one we choose. And I would actually agree with you when it comes to one type of sex differences, which are quantitative sex differences. Unfortunately, or interestingly, depending on how you want to look at it, there are also in this domain any number of uh, far more intriguing and far more problematic qualitative sex differences, and I'm going to give you an example. So here's a quantitative sex difference. You take a mouse, you stick its tail in hot water, you measure the amount of time it takes for it to take its tail out of the hot water, and boom, females do that 10% uh, faster than males, very reliable, and again, one could ask themselves, well, so what, it's a little difference. And uh, it doesn't uh, make, uh, uh, you know, doesn't ruin your experiment in any way. Um, but here's another sex difference. Um, it turns out in the literature, there's about 100 papers showing that phenomenon right there, that if you add dextromethorphan to morphine, you get more morphine, uh, you get more analgesia, more pain inhibition than with morphine alone. Again, 100 studies, Every single one of them was done in males. If you do this study in female mice, you find that there is no interaction between dextromethorphan and morphine at any dose of morphine or at any dose of dextromethorphan. This is a qualitative sex difference because there simply is no way to get dextromethorphan uh, to uh, potentiate uh, morphine analgesia in female mice. Why does this matter? Well, on the strength of the first 100 studies, a drug company spent God knows how many tens of millions of dollars to run this clinical trial on a drug they called Morphidex, a one-to-one -one combination of morphine and dextromethorphan, and this trial failed utterly. Now, did it fail because there were gender differences or sex differences in these data? Um, I don't know. I actually called them up and asked them to reanalyze the data by sex, and they were prevented by their legal department from doing so. And so we'll never really know if that's what happened here, but I would at the very least suggest that if the primary literature leading to this clinical trial had contained even a single study in female animals, then this clinical trial would have been run in a very different way. I think that what I've just shown you is actually the tip of the iceberg, um, and in fact, there are many, many qualitative sex differences to be found in the, in the pain field. Um, and we just published um, one of them that's actually quite uh, remarkable. Um, 
don't worry about the complexity of the slide. All I'm trying to show you here is that until about 15 years ago, we were only interested in the green cells. This is the spinal cord. Um, and uh, most of pain biology was assumed to have primary afferent neurons synapsing on dorsal horn neurons, sending the information up to the thalamus, and voila, uh, eventually you get pain perception. In the last 15 years, the evidence has increased that other cell types, uh, notably astrocytes and especially the purple microglia on the left are really very importantly involved uh, in the signaling here. Um, and this is a very, very um, uh, healthy and uh, important subfield of pain research at the present time. And we now believe that the microglial involvement in pain in the spinal cord is entirely male specific. And the reason no one has realized that till now is again because no one has done any studies in female rats and mice to find out. Um, the data are uh, a little bit complicated, um, but I'll walk you through it briefly. Uh, they all are obtained in the following form. We measure baseline sensitivity to mechanical stimulation. That's where the BL means. Um, and then we induce some sort of injury. It turns out not to matter whether that injury is inflammatory or neuropathic. In every case, uh, what we see is mechanical allodynia, right? The lowering of those thresholds uh, to withdraw. It's important to note, as you can see by comparing the pink and the blue, that the amount of mechanical allodynia is exactly the same in males and females. The sex difference occurs when you try to reverse it with some drug. And as you can see in this case, in males, that drug was effective in reversing the allodynia, at least temporarily. Uh, whereas in the females, it was not. Um, what you're looking at here is the drug minocycline, um, which, uh, of course, is a very dirty drug. I'm sorry, this is not Impress. <laughs> this is out already. It came out uh, this year in Nature Neuroscience. Um, so this is minocycline, uh, which is a dirty drug, but one of its actions is the inhibition of uh, glia. Um, you get the same result with another dirty drug, fluorocitrate, and one of its actions is the inhibition of microglia. And the same thing with propentophilin, again, another glial inhibitor. In fact, you can lesion the glia and take them away completely, and absolutely nothing changes in female mice. Um, there's you know, four, five, six, seven lines of evidence pointing to the fact that male, uh, male mice Mice require microglia to maintain this chronic pain symptom, whereas female mice uh, can maintain the pain symptom just fine, but they're doing it in an entirely different way. And with data I don't have time to show you, we believe that uh, uh, way involves T cells infiltrating into the spinal cord instead of microglia. Um, we're proud of this because we think this might be actually the first example of a sex difference in the cellular mediation of a non-reproductive phenomenon. That is to say males and females uh, both produce the same effect, um, but they do it using completely different cell types, and we're not sure there's precedent for that. Um, a little follow-up that's very interesting uh, is uh, something that uh, we're uh, almost done with now, and this concerns the phenomenon of pregnancy analgesia. So it's well known uh, among clinicians that uh, women with pre-existing chronic pain syndromes uh, will often show abatement of their chronic pain symptoms during pregnancy, especially in the third trimester. And then after they give birth or sometimes after they finish lactating, uh, the symptoms come right back. Uh, we think we have a mouse model model of this now. Again, animals are given uh, something called a spared nerve injury. It's an uh, experimental nerve damage. Um, you can see that they uh, become allodynic, and then we get them pregnant, and slowly but surely through the pregnancy, that allodynia completely resolves. By uh, one day before birth, it's entirely gone. They give birth to their pups, and the allodynia comes right back. And why we think this sex difference is related to the one I just showed you is because if you do exactly the same experiment in nude mice that don't have any T cells, um, their pregnancy analgesia is completely gone. And we can do adoptive transfers and shift animals back and forth from one state into another. The last story I want to tell you, um, and uh, in this one, it's a direct mouse to human translation, which is uh, the goal of our lab uh, increasingly, uh, is to tell you about uh, a very intriguing sex difference in a phenomenon known as conditioned pain. Um, in mice, how it works like this. Um, you test their sensitivity to heat. Um, you uh, inject a, a, a nasty inflammatory substance into their belly, acetic acid, um, and then they uh, 
perform pain behaviors for a, a, a little bit of time while enclosed in a cylinder in a room in our lab. And then the very next day, the acetic acid is long gone. They are simply placed back into the same room and the same cylinder as on day one or into a box instead of a cylinder in a completely different room um, and tested again for thermal pain sensitivity. And what we find um, is that uh, if they are placed into the same room on the second day, they are hyperalgesic. They're more sensitive to pain than they were on day one. If they're put into a different context, they're not hyperalgesic. If anything, they're slightly analgesic. Um, it turns out that this phenomenon is entirely male specific. Okay, it is only the males that are becoming hyperalgesic in the same context and only the males that have analgesia in the different context. In females, there's absolutely nothing going on here at all. So this is a male-specific phenomenon uh, in mice. We've shown in data I don't have time to show you that this is testosterone dependent. Uh, it's due to stress. Um, this phenomenon is stress-induced hyperalgesia. This phenomenon is stress-induced analgesia from the novelty of the new room, uh, which is an old phenomenon and so we're not particularly interested in that, but this is a completely novel phenomenon. It turns out that you can do this exact same experiment in people. Um, well, not exactly the same. We're not injecting acetic acid into anyone's bellies, but close enough. So in humans, again, it starts with thermal testing, and then we show them a really bad time. We use the ischemic tourniquet test. People really, really hate the ischemic tourniquet test. Uh, you have a blood pressure cuff on real tight, and then we make you exercise your arm. People regularly give uh, ratings of eight and nine out of 10, um, and they do this for 15 minutes. They absolutely hate it, and then they go home. They come back on the next day and they are either taken back into the same room and simply tested for their thermal thresholds again. Or we make up some ruse that that room wasn't available and in fact the experimenter wasn't available. And so there's a completely different person taking them into a completely different room and again, in fact in a different building and giving them uh, uh, the same thermal test. And lo and behold, uh, you have to flip this in your mind because more pain now goes in the different direction as it did in the mouse experiment. But it's exactly the same finding as in mice. Men put back into the same context, show stress-induced hyperalgesia, um, uh, and we can verify this with cortisol levels. Um, uh, in women, there's absolutely no effect at all. Um, the implications of all of this for analgesic development are at once obvious, um, but uh, uh, at another, you know, at the same time radical, right? What I'm actually proposing here is that one of these days, someone is going to develop an analgesic based on microglia, based on T cells, based on some of this biology that at least in the mouse is entirely sex specific. And that analgesic is going to work in one sex and not the other. And if that happens, uh, that will will probably be about the first time in biomedicine, and my uh, prediction is, is that this will happen uh, in pain research uh, before it happens in any other domain, and so it'll be very interesting to watch, I think. Um, and of course, I want to thank the uh, funders, the folks who actually did the work, and thank you very much for your attention. So, thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Mogul. This is a very interesting um, subject. Um, so the presentation is open for discussion. If there's any questions. At hypogonadal men will have less uh, di differences than normal gonadal men? Um, yeah, well, so obviously we haven't done the human experiment. It is certainly true that castrated males uh, show switching. What happens here is that it appear, there appears to be two separate systems that are both there. It's just under normal circumstances, if you have enough testosterone over a certain threshold, you'll use the microglial system. And if your testosterone is below that threshold, you'll use the T-cell system. Um, and we can get mice to switch back and forth um, by either taking away or giving back uh, testosterone. So, so yes, what, what you're implying in humans would be the direct prediction, yeah. Um, but, but of course, remember that you wouldn't see a difference, right? This is why this is a subtle thing, right? The amount of pain will be the same, right? It's just that it's being processed using one pathway or another pathway, which is why this is subtle uh, and probably why it hasn't been noticed before. 
So you mentioned it's um, the um, stress-related, uh, context-related um, changes in, in, in pain um, uh, perception. I imagine it's it's a perception of pain. Is that is that what they're feeling? Well, at least in human studies, or um, you're sure. saying it's a different yeah. threshold, or well. Uh, you know, uh, you can measure it different ways with the Medox. So you can you can measure thresholds, or you can measure tolerances, or you can measure ratings. Um, in our particular case, we were measuring thresholds, but I don't think it would actually matter. And in mice, of course, it doesn't matter whether you're using threshold measures or you know super threshold uh, frequency measures. Um, I guess my question is uh, regarding the. T so you said it's, it's testosterone related, and uh, it changes through cortisol. So it's a is it some kind of communication between testosterone and the, and, and, and the sympathetic system, or yeah. is it? Um, that, that's a fine point, whether there's a direct link or an indirect link between the testosterone and the stress. Um, you know, I, I, not necessarily, right? I mean, this is obviously, it, the phenomenon is due to stress. We, we know this for a fact. And again, stress-induced analgesia, stress-induced hyperalgesia, they're very, very well-known phenomenon. Um, I, I think testosterone is uh, acting as a switch um, that either engages this system so that it can be activated and you know, cortisol or corticosterone can do what it does, um, or shunts it away such that the system is never engaged. Uh, I, I don't think it's likely that there's a direct relationship between testosterone and the stress hormones, other than the ones we already know. I see. Yes, please. Great talk, thank you very much. Really interesting. What piqued my curiosity is whether you replicated the microglial studies with the microglial inhibitors using T cell inhibitors in females. And the reason why I ask is because at least in the field of urology, a lot of the you know chronic pain syndromes in, in patients in the bladder are in women. So I was curious about anti-inflammatories, I guess, in this, in this phenomenon. Yeah, we, we, we clearly have a lot of work to do uh, in this respect, and we've got uh, Brain Canada grants, and we've started to do uh, experiments along those lines. In the original paper, um, we weren't impressed with the selectivity of, the, of any of the available T-cell inhibitors. I mean, they're even dirtier uh, than, than the uh, microglial inhibitors. But what we did, of course, have available to us were uh, two different uh, types of T-cell deficient mice. Um, and so our, our T-cell conclusions at this point are based largely on the fact that if you do experiments in either nude mice or RAG1 mice, um, even the females are using the male system. Right, presumably because their T cell dependent system is not available to them because they don't have any T cells. So that you know, that's the best I can say at this point. Miguel Jimenez from Madrid. Um, as a urologist, uh, we see many many males that are castrated, that are under treatment because of prostate cancer. Yeah. Are there any uh, study on that population or uh, hypogonadic males or so? Because it it looks a good. Uh, Contrapopulation, no, to see how the effect of uh, yeah. testosterone diminution is uh, working. Yeah, again, uh, you know, this is a really, really good idea. It's just difficult for me to picture right now what the exact experiment is in humans here, right? Because it would be simple enough to get hypogonadal males and measure their chronic pain sensitivity, but I wouldn't predict based on these data that you're going to see any difference in the amount of pain. Right? So the question is then, are they engaging microglia? And it's not even a simple matter of do they have as many microglia. They have, they have microglia, they have T cells. The question is, which one are they using? Um, and it's not clear to me in humans how to get at that answer. But, but I agree that at, at some point when we figure out how to do so, this is an absolutely critical population to look at for this hypothesis, for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Nina Davis from Portland. Um, I'm sort of interested in this whole idea of testosterone, the link, be, be, you know, with stress, which I didn't know about. And, and I just wonder, could you speculate on the role of the adrenal gland in general? Because I find it very interesting that your epinephrine and your cortisol, which are the two stress hormones, plus testosterone all come from the adrenal gland. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that's a strange question to ask uh, of a neuroscientist. It's not something I uh, think about a lot. I, I, again, I, I would sort of reiterate that I think it's unlikely 
that we're actually talking about a direct interaction between testosterone and stress hormones. What I really think is happening um, is that, um, so the, the, the stress hormones are doing what they're doing and engaging, you know, known pathways, uh, um, um, you know, that descend through the midbrain to the brain stem to the spinal cord uh, that produce stress-induced analgesia and stress-induced hyperalgesia. Um, and I think that testosterone is acting somewhere in the brain uh, in order to set the system in one of two positions, right? The position where this phenomenon can be engaged and the position that blocks it from being engaged. Um, so, you know, I can't really answer your question, but, but to be honest, I don't think things going on in the adrenal are actually particularly relevant uh, to what's going on here, other than the fact that if the stress axis isn't engaged, then these phenomenon don't occur. Um. To, to, to draw a parallel with Dr. Cervera's presentation, um, with the microglia uh, being more active in the male um, rats, at least, um, and we know that there are some CB2 receptors, some cannabinoid type 2 receptors in, in, in that uh, cell population, is there any possibility that CB2, or is there any evidence that CB2 seems to be more active in, in males versus uh, female uh, animals, or has, has that been looked at? or? I'm not, I usually keep tabs on uh, which molecules have been shown to have a sex difference within the pain domain, and CB2 doesn't uh, ring any bells. Um, we do, in fact, have a signal transduction pathway in microglia uh, that we are studying, and we seem, in fact, uh, to have found the precise location of the sex difference here. Um, and so it is somewhere, uh, uh, um, after TLR4 and before uh, P2X4, um, in fact, it looks like the sex difference is in the regulation of P2X4 itself. Now, again, whether CB2s are somewhere in this circuit, uh, um, I actually don't know. Great. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Mogul. It was a great, great talk.